Hey everyone, welcome back to our eighth annual installment of what new MMOs are coming out this year. Hey, fun fact about the series, some of the games on this list were also on the first one we made back in 2016. Another fun fact, some of these games will absolutely be on next year's list as well, a testament not just to the extremely long development time MMOs require, but also to how early we hear about some of them. In particular, much of that crowdfunded bunch, a few of which we've known about for, I, I don't know, nearly a decade. Okay, now, anyway, taking a look ahead, I wanted to try to paint a clear picture of exactly what we're expecting. Like, what new MMOs will finally release and be playable in 2024? That is the question. I'm looking to answer and address here today. Now, first up on our list and pretty much the most guaranteed surefire bet is the release of Throne and Liberty, mainly because this game has actually already released, but in Korea and will be getting a global launch sometime in early 2024, according to what we've heard. Now, despite a poor reception to its beta from last summer, I am still holding on to a glimmer of hope for two main reasons. For one, they've listened to and implemented changes based on beta feedback, seemingly addressing the major components complaints by improving combat and removing all of the autoplay mobile features. And two, barring those changes are good enough, the base core of the game sounds really awesome. Beyond offering the standard suite of content that most open world MMOs have, Throne and Liberty in particular boasts a few interesting features. So yes, it's got an open world, they say it's seamless with zero loading screens, instant fast travel, but mainly the fact that it supports a very large number of simultaneous players. We have seen screenshots with hundreds and hundreds of players on screen, and the game looks pretty good on top of that to boot. As an Unreal Engine 4 game, even without upgrading to UE5, the visuals are a selling point for me. From the raw gameplay that I've seen, and by all accounts, this is a pretty good looking game, and beyond looking good, it appears to have some great clarity and render distance, which make that open world that's seamless with tons of players all that much more impressive. They do have the expected assortment of biomes, there's fantasy and medieval inspired locations with both PvE and PvP offerings. On the PvE side, there's a big focus on difficult group content. We've seen quite a few large-scale boss battles with both instance and open world encounters. They've got solo challenges like this boss tower rush. There's a fully open world, multi-layer, non-instance dungeon system, kind of along the lines of, I don't know, I think of something like public dungeons in ESO, but much bigger, fully open world, more sprawling, and with a lot more players. PvP will include small-scale skirmishes, large open world battles where players fight over territory or bosses. There's castle sieges with hundreds hundreds of players defending and attacking. They've got this really cool dynamic weather and time of day system that directly affects enemies, your abilities, and even the terrain. So this includes doing things like making enemies stronger or weaker depending on the weather, or enhancing or debuffing player abilities, or restricting and or opening up access to various parts of the world. Besides weather, the day-night cycle also plays into this as well. There's a ton of traversal features with you being able to mantle and climb most of the environment. You got a grapple hook and can transform into a variety of animals and the game features a classless system where you are not locked into a role or class when making a character. Instead, your skills and abilities are determined by whatever two weapons you choose to equip, much along the same lines of what you see in something like New World or Albion Online. Yeah, Throne and Liberty sounds really great on many, many levels. I think one of the biggest sticking points at the moment is definitely going to be the game's monetization. Now, they've promised no pay to win. However, we do know that the main currency in the player trading auction house is paid for real money premium currency. We know that that the game will utilize a gear upgrade system, a popular in many Eastern MMOs, where you start with base pieces of gear and then spend resources to rank it up. However, the higher you go, while it gets stronger, it's also a lot more likely to fail. Although at least in Throne and Liberty's case, there is no downgrading and even a quote fail will provide some sort of an upgrade, even if it's just a small percentage towards a 100% next uh, upgrade tier, which really to me sort of sounds like they're just surfacing a built-in pity system or something like this. Like, yes, you can fail a bunch, but eventually you will fill up the bar and succeed or you will get a successful upgrade. And while it is good that the game doesn't have any loot boxes or gacha mechanics, and then will instead focus on battle pass subscriptions, cosmetics, and the auction house transactions, we do know that they will be some sort of like pay to skip stuff. Now, as mentioned, Throne in Liberty has already released with the launch of its Korea version happening on December 7th. Feedback has been slowly trickling out. We're starting to see impressions and reviews, and it seems as expected, and as I kind of had hoped, people have a generally positive impression of the gameplay and the systems, the content, the game playing part of the game seems pretty good, but a lot of people at the same time are not terribly thrilled about the monetization. 
surprise, surprise. Now changes can be made. It is possible. There might be some differences between this version of the game and the one that we get globally and here in the West. We'll have to wait and see. Like mentioned, a global release for Throne and Liberty is planned for early 2024. Although as of this recording, no exact date has been announced. I do think there's a strong possibility we find out sometime soon. Dune Awakening is an open world survival MMO being developed by Funcom. Now this studio is probably best known for their multiplayer survival game Conan Exiles, but they also have a long history of making the more traditional style MMO, including Anarchy Online back in 2001 and Age of Conan in 08. Now for their next game, it looks like they will be combining this past experience, making something that pulls a bit from both of these genres. They have said that Dune Awakening will have the social interactivity of large scale persistent multiplayer games while also including unique and ambitious survival mechanics. All of this set in a vast and seamless world, the Dunes of Arrakis, that will be inhabited and shared by thousands of players. Now, when they say shared by thousands in my head, I think, yeah, simultaneously all on the same server, which would be pretty impressive considering their plans for large scale battles. So the game will feature third person combat that will have both small scale engagements and massive battles. Total war is what they're referring to this as. And when further discussing the sort of encounters we can expect, it actually sounds like they're planning something akin to a battlefield or planet side experience. So you'll have ground troops running around with ranged and melee weapons. There's also some elements of magic in this game. They'll be skirmishing in groups or solo players trying to sneak behind enemy lines, capture resources and stuff like that. While simultaneously, other players will be controlling an assortment of both ground and air vehicles. They say that we can expect a fast paced interplay between infantry, ground and flying vehicles, all fighting for key points of interest and resources like spice as a, a main form that drives the game's progression. So again, if it is true that they deliver on thousands of players on a server with this large scale combat, that would be pretty impressive, but we'll have to wait and see whether they go with that dedicated server shards where there are literally thousands of people in your field of view, or if it's more phasing and insta instancing through the use of mega servers. Now, outside of that, Dune Awakening will have most of the expected survival game features. There is base building, there's crafting of gear and vehicles, there are survival mechanics like thirst will play a big role, but probably one of the more interesting selling points and features for this game it all revolves around its setting. So in the world of Dune, the environment is a constant threat, and as such, massive sandstorms regularly change the landscape. This will mean areas that you visited the day prior could become buried, but at the same time, the shifting sands will reveal new locations and secrets, from resources to crashed ships and ancient testing stations. After a storm comes by, when the dust settles, players will then compete, scouting the fresh new landscape to see what was uncovered. And then there are the sandworms. Now, these are drawn to disturbances, including things like combat. So those large battles we talked about, the longer they go on, the more gunfire and the more commotion that gets kicked up, the more likely a sandworm is to be drawn to it and appear emerging from the sand and swallowing everything in its path. Uh, if one shows up and you are in its mouth vicinity, you are basically done for. And if I recall correctly, they have talked about some sort of gear loss upon death or something like that, because yes, there are many survival elements in this game. Now, unfortunately, as of yet, we have not actually seen any raw game play. Most of the details and information about Dune Awakening have come from marketing and interviews and their website. We did, however, get that pre-alpha trailer with some in-engine footage, which I thought looked good. But of course, we will have to wait and see until we actually see the game running, controlled by a player, or better yet, get to play the game ourselves. Uh, but from what I've seen and heard so far, I think this one seems promising. Dune Awakening is set to enter Steam Early Access in 2024. They have already begun beta testing and have actually had a few rounds already. In fact, they're still actively testing as far as I'm aware, and you can register to enter and be accepted over on their website. Once Human is a third person open world MMO that heavily combines systems and mechanics from both the looter shooter and survival games genre. Now this one kind of came out of nowhere and has been a real pleasant surprise. I played it for a few days recently as part of a sponsorship, but then once that was done, I kind of just kept on playing and it's been that way for nearly a week. So this game reminds me a lot of other games that I've enjoyed. It's like a mix of The Division, Defy Science, secret world, and survival stuff all put on top of it. We got a lot of survival in our MMOs nowadays, but I guess that's just how it is. So yes, on one hand, it feels just like an open world looter shooter, a la the Division, Defiance, or even Firefall. You'll go around the open world doing PvE stuff, fighting enemies and bosses, collecting materials and loot. This world is completely 
completely open. There's no loading screens as you're walking around and moving through the zones. And you'll see all of the usual expected flora and fauna of the different biomes that you explore. But jam-packed within that is a lot of locations, points of interest, and activities to do that kind of fill that shooting game, looking for loot, harvesting resources. So first, there are the strongholds. And this is really like the primary form of open world PvE activity. These are basically enemy camps. Uh, locations will consist of various settlements, outposts, hospitals, military bases, all sorts of things that will have a number of objectives within them that you go to complete for experience and loot. This will include things typically like killing X number of enemies, uh, a few elites or bosses, finding crates like weapon and gear caches, or these mysterious treasures. But beyond this sort of base checklist of objectives, most strongholds that we've seen have had basically hidden side quests or objectives as well. Like you might come across an area where you see a power down elevator, and then you see nearby there is a fuse box and you need to find and place a fuse in it. Doing so then powers up the elevator, letting you take it to the top where you'll find a hidden boss or a loot chest. Or maybe in one town you come across a ghost who is in need of help and leads you to tracking down all sorts of clues in the area that eventually reveal their gravesite and have its own reward. Or maybe exploring one stronghold you come across these pieces of paper with cryptic clues and numbers on them and it turns out these were the number combinations for a locked container. It just seems like a lot if not most of the strongholds will have these extra layers beyond the, that checklist of objectives that I've really appreciated. There's like something additional to discover about these areas rather than just killing enemies and opening chest. Outside of strongholds there's all sorts of different world events, uh, dynamic events that can pop up as you explore. Like we'd be walking around and we'd see this fog roll in with a warning timer and then inside of the fog were all these like crazy enemies and then if you kill them in time you get some loot. There are roaming world bosses. At one point I was in my base, I looked out the window and there was a school bus with six legs stampeding across. I tried shooting it and it said it was immune. I had no idea what was going on. We also saw this like massive like a uh, four or five story tall giant with a flowery head that emerged out of a screen at an amphitheater. Like really, really interesting stuff. There's like horde mode activities that can appear in the world where you gotta fight off waves of PVE enemies. And there's all sorts of other points of interest uh, outside of those main strongholds. There's a bunch of different smaller enemy camps where you can find things and kill enemies. There are NPC filled towns with vendors and side quests. There's teleportation towers. There are boss fights. These are called monoliths. We've already fought a few. There was the foul shadow hunter, which was like this twisted mutant with a gun for a hand and had all sorts of different things like summoning up ads and shooting rockets and spewing out poison pools. And then there was this tree ant boss, this big tree creature that summoned giant uh, tentacle branches and spit out bubbles that would track us down. It even shot down a, a freaking laser beam. And on top of these boss fights, there are additional kind of more typical group dungeons that you can do. The game's got PVP with open world PVP events, areas that are marked on the map where if you walk into it, you're flagged for PVP, you compete for rewards. There's also base rate mechanics. If you go on PvP servers, it's like PvP all the time. You can actively attack other players' bases. And that is just like the uh, kind of MMO looter shooter side of the game. There's like 50% of the game that's also straight up survival games. Survival systems like stamina, sanity, hydration, and hunger. There's full on base building with blueprints and all sorts of besides constructing a building, you can do all these crafting stations, refineries. There's like base defenses. There's of course gathering to go along with this crafting and base building. There are mobile camps that act as respawn points. You can do as you're out exploring difficult areas. There's a ton of progression systems like this cradle that you have on your back that unlocks blueprint uh, for base building and also has these power-ups called overrides. There's a whole blueprint system where most of the game, pretty much all, all of the gear in the game comes through crafting, player crafting. Yeah, there's a lot to this game. It's a fairly dense and kind of interesting combination of different genres. And, and frankly, why I'm most excited is because yes, it reminds me of a lot of games that I've played and enjoyed in the past. Now, all of that said, there's a real high possibility that this game will have, yes, some so for, some form of pay to win and pay to progression. That's pretty much o almost guaranteed. In fact, already we know that the higher rarity star rating blueprints for gear has some sort of gacha system tied into it to unlocking and getting those a higher highest tiers of gear. But that said, I've played like 30 hours now at the point of this recording, and I have not even really seen this stuff come into effect, although it is a beta, so maybe it's not as it will be at launch. But already there is just a lot of game here. There's a lot of game that I've enjoyed and there are still things that I'm discovering every time that I play. It's just been a real pleasant surprise, I gotta tell ya. So once Human is scheduled to release in 2024 and whatever comes to the game's monetization, I, I do have to say the content and features wide, at the moment this is one of my more anticipated MMOs of this year. This isn't, an, this isn't another sponsor from the, like, 
It's just, I, it's just this game took me by surprise pleasantly. But yeah, that said, as far as we know, it's got gotcha and probably will have pay to win. So if that's a deal breaker for you, I totally understand, right? Blue Protocol. This is an action combat anime MMO from Bandai Namco. Now, similar to Throne in Liberty, this game has actually already released in certain parts of the world with a global version planned for 2024. And another similarity is that both games' global versions are being published by Amazon, which we'll get to that significance in just a moment. Now, I gotta say, I quite like the look of Blue Protocol, although anime is isn't a personal interest or hobby of mine. The visuals and gameplay of this thing look fantastic. Like I'm really impressed with how slick, smooth, responsive, and impactful combat appears to be. One big downside for this one though, is that it's not an open world MMO. Instead, we're getting a lobby based shared world with instant zones, loading screens between them and player caps. It appears that most zones will have a max capacity of 30 players. I think towns are said to be around 200 people. But outside of that, Blue Protocol does have the standard suite of offerings for theme park MMOs, plenty of PvP, content with dungeons and raids, various forms of PvP, there's gear crafting and life skills, social hubs, and a variety of zones with different biomes to explore and hidden secrets like a chest and discoverable pets. There are several classes to choose from. These include filling the roles of sword and board tank, melee brawler, ranged bow user, a ranged elemental mage, and a few others. Each of these classes can equip up to four base skills that can be strengthened and modified with skill points. You basically can select various combinations of abilities and modifiers to sort of customize your play style. And then there are these things called monster skills, these mystical echoes, which are like spiritual remnants of creatures you interact with that can unleash powerful attacks for you in battle. I actually don't quite understand this one. Now, prior to launching in Japan, it was said that Blue Protocol would have zero pay to win. But wouldn't you know it? Turns out they might have pay to win. Now, they are focusing monetization, they say, on a season pass and cosmetics, but they said, hey, no power or progression. But now that the game is out, we do know that there are gotcha mechanics in the game. It appears to have some form of pay for power. From what I understand, there's this ticket system that is used to boost your weapon's crafting rate. Uh, speaking of which, yes, this game utilizes a gear upgrade or honing system where you have to enhance your weapons with these plugs and sockets, which require rolling the dice for a chance to fail. But that chance can be mitigated by using those gotcha tickets. So yeah, in other words, it's another convoluted system of upgrades and enhancements designed to push you towards spending money in the cash shop or in the loot box, basically, the gotcha system. Uh, as usual with this style of game, we'll get what enjoyment we can out of it before running into the paywall, right? That's the most we can hope for. Uh, now, Blue Protocol will be free to play. It is currently planned to release in 2024 on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, although no firm date for that global launch has been announced yet. Now, going back to the fact that uh, Blue Protocol and Throne of Liberty are both being published by Amazon. Now, what that means is we should expect the release dates for both of these games to be fairly spread apart. Now, so if it does end up being the case that Throne in Liberty comes in early 2024, that would mean we should expect Blue Protocol to release in late 2024, uh, but certainly not within the same quarter. That would be a massive surprise. All right, next up, we got Core Punk. This is a game that we've been keeping track of for quite some time. It's the top-down MMO that looks to play fairly similar to a MOBA just set in an MMO world. It's got mouse click movement, a relatively slow pace of combat, skill shots that need to be aimed, and a class system that has you selecting from a roster of heroes rather than creating a character from scratch. Now, even though it's a top-down game, they do say it's got a big seamless open world. We'll explore these zones, various biomes like forests and deserts and all sorts of stuff. And these will be uh, filled with enemies and camps, ruins, caves, strongholds, along with small villages or large cities full of NPCs and other places players. We'll do the expecting, questing, leveling, uh, grinding for loot and gearing up. There are multiple heroes to choose from, like we said, instead of making a class, you're picking a default hero that has like its own name and backstory, but these will come with three different masteries, which basically act as specializations with their own corresponding set of skills and abilities. Group PvE content includes dungeons, they'll be handcrafted and procedurally generated varieties. There's also raids and other large scale group challenges. There's a big emphasis in this game on the fog of war mechanic like many top-down games or like MOBAs this is said to uh, incentivize exploration and discovery PvP will have a range from open world where you can use that fog of war to sneak up on other players to more structured fights in like arenas and battlegrounds other traditional MMO systems include crafting and gathering farming pack deliveries epic quests guild systems and more now gear in the game is purely cosmetic apparently the hero power and progression comes mainly via these artifacts that will affect your ability 
abilities, as well as give you access to new powers and boost your stats. This along with further customization that can be done by leveling up your hero and selecting from multiple different playstyle focus skill trees. And all of this once again in that top-down perspective, sort of like a MOBA uh, with MOBA-like mechanics, moving your character, interacting with objects, attacking enemies, all done by clicking things with your mouse. So development of Core Punk has been trucking along in the past months. They've held several first look play tests with blogs recapping those experiences. They do have a test scheduled for this month and I do plan to check that out. Uh, expect more coverage from me on Core Punk sometime soon. As of today, Core Punk is targeting a 2024 release and it does seem like they are on track to hit it. Project LLL. This is an open world MMO looter shooter. It's going to have seamless exploration and takes place in an alternate reality version of Seoul, South Korea. This will include a mixture of city, wilderness, outdoor, and indoor environments, all with a touch of sci-fi and fantasy and a lot of other dimensional stuff going on in this game. Uh, all these spaces and locations will be full of an assortment of enemies, either this primary faction of cyborgs, along with your typical MMO open world activities, events, points of interest, and other players. The game has PvE with public events, dungeons, and raids, as well as PvP, offering both competitive modes and open world fighting. Besides third person shooting and the standard assortment of weapons in a game like this, there's also a ton of high tech themed gadgets and abilities like invisibility cloaks, scouting drones, grav grenades, missile launchers, aimbot ultimates, jetpacks, and bullet deflecting bubbles. Vehicles will also have a big presence, both land and air. There's also this like Titanfall-esque mech system where these titans fall from the sky and you can jump in them and control them and blow stuff up. Now, not too long ago, we saw some raw gameplay at a live stream event. And honestly, it didn't look all that bad. We saw players dropping into this open world environment and just doing basic open world stuff, going around clearing enemies, using abilities, completing objectives, rescuing stuff, bunch of different raw gameplay. We saw group play. We saw boss encounters. We saw different public events. Seemed like it was not bad. Now I gotta say though, after recently playing Once Human Project LLL, doesn't look as impressive as I initially thought it was, but we have only seen bits and pieces of gameplay. That There was like a 45 minute live stream and it didn't really show much in terms of systems and features. It was just pretty bog standard open world. Character drops in, you shoot enemies, you do a couple of objectives, which in this case, uh, they were mostly just like interacting with terminals. But I am still holding out hope. I do think that this game has a good premise. It has an interesting setting. And I just really hope they can deliver on features and systems uh, and have a lot more than what we have seen of the game thus far. I do understand that there's supposed to be a pretty big emphasis on PvP in this one, although we've yet to really see that in action. Now, there is one other MMO that is scheduled to release in 2024. It's called Ashfall. But having played a beta just a few months ago, I'll tell you up front, don't bother. Uh, just uh, it's absolutely not going to be worth your time. This is a mobile game being ported to PC and it feels very lacking in many ways. The look, the world, the systems, the gameplay. I disliked pretty much all of it unless you just really enjoy phone games and phone MMOs. If that's the case, by all means, play it, have a blast. But if you are a PC or console focused gamer, I will not expect too much out of this one. So those are all of the new MMOs we currently know have a release date planned and scheduled for sometime in 2024. But I know at this point you might be asking yourself, hey, what about all those like highly anticipated MMOs from these big name, big budget AAA developers? Well, fact of the matter is, None of those are coming out in 2024, let's be honest. Things like the Riot MMO set in League of Legends World of Runeterra, Blizzard's survival MMO that they kind of soft revealed in 2022 that we still don't even have the name of, the Sony MMO in the Horizon universe, or heck, there's even a Marvel MMO being made by Dimensional Inc. Yes, a lot of us are looking forward to these solely based on the developers and their pedigrees, but the fact of the matter is not a single one of them even have an official reveal yet. We do not know the names of any of these games or anything about them really. So no, we most certainly won't be playing any of these in 2024. But that is just really focusing on the brand new stuff. There's more in the MMO, MMO sphere that we can expect to get that is new and that's coming via expansions and updates. So there's a few things for World of Warcraft for one. We've got that War Within expansion they revealed at BlizzCon. Uh, this is the first of three planned expansions over the coming years. War Within planned for 2024. Also in the World of Warcraft, we got things like the classic era updates. Right now, Season of Discovery is in full swing. I've been playing it a lot since it released and have really enjoyed my time with it. It's just a cool new twist on classic World of Warcraft. And then at some point in 2024, they're gonna be releasing the 
hardcore self found. So no uh, streamers getting boosted. Actually, they probably will because they'll just form groups where people basically do all the work for them and then they just collect the gear. But you know, for the regular people, the, that aren't getting boosted by an audience. It, it's a cool new twist to hardcore. And then outside of World of Warcraft, we know that Elder Scrolls Online will be getting another year of updates. In fact, I should note, this is the 10 year anniversary of its release. So this could be a pretty big year for an ESO update. And then we get new stuff coming to Final Fantasy 14 with Dawn Trail. We expect new updates for Guild Wars 2. And frankly, most of the major MMOs are likely either getting big patches or expansions at some point in 2024. Outside of that, there is a very long list of still in development MMOs that we really aren't expecting to come out in 2024, likely 2025 or beyond. We're talking about Pax Day, Soul Frame, Arc Age 2, Bitcraft, Project Ragnarok, Into the Echo, Chrono Odyssey, Odin Valhalla Rising, The Quinfall. How about those crowdfunded games, right? Like Ashes of Creation, Pantheon Rise of the Fallen, Camelot Unchained. Yeah, maybe it happens. Maybe I get struck by lightning, but we're not really expecting any of these games to come out in 2024. It's probably not happening. The good news is, besides the list of games that I did run through that are pretty much confirmed for this year, as with prior years, there's a good chance that some in development games that are nearing release or aren't on our radar or even haven't been officially revealed yet will come out in 2024. We can be taken by surprise. Some of these timelines could move forward and games that we don't expect to fully release may actually at the very least get something like an early access launch or if that that's not the case, we are bound to see some alpha and beta tests take place for many, if not most of the games that I just mentioned. While it's not a full release, there will still be opportunity to get some hands on time with many of the games mentioned here. But regardless, seems like it's going to be a pretty decent year for MMOs. There is quite a lot here that I'm looking forward to. And yeah, 2024, here's to some new MMOs. And yes, as I said at the top, there's uh, probably a good chunk of the games that we talked about that will be on 2025's list as well. That's just the way it is, right? <laughs> All right. Thanks. That's it. That's it for today. Thank you as always for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time, guys. Take it easy.